word this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth and we receive it, written in our heart, written in our mind. Thank you for the revelation of it. We will be hearers and doers of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated if you would. We've been sharing with you a series of messages about tests and temptations, trials, and we have seen the fact that man tests God when he rebels against him and doesn't do what he tells him to do, and he limits him, and he shuts down God's work in his life, brings judgment upon man. We've also seen how Satan comes to test man, to take the word out, to steal, kill, and destroy, to bring destruction, to accomplish a destructive work in man's life and stop the blessings from coming, to pour, coming forth. We also see that God tests man with his word to see whether man will walk in line with it so he can bring forth his promises, all the things that he has purposed for man. And if we pass the tests, then God will bring those to pass. We've talked about how people failed. And now today we're going to talk about those who pass the spiritual tests and what they did that was necessary to see it come to pass. We begin in Psalms 105, verse 19 again. This is speaking in the context about Joseph a couple of verses back. And it says, Until the time that his word came, speaking of the coming of the word or the coming to pass of the word, this can mean, the word of the Lord tried him. The word of the Lord tested him. And that's exactly what God's going to do. And the testing produces a refining it produces bringing you to the place of being shown that you are genuine, you are the real deal, you are walking after the ways of the Lord. Well, the word of the Lord is trying us throughout our life to see whether we're going to follow him all the days of our life. He expects us to do that. So we mentioned we're going to talk about those who pass the test. We begin in Genesis chapter 4. In Genesis chapter 4, Abel was the righteous one who passed the test. Genesis 4.4 4. Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. He passed the test. God had obviously told him to bring the tithe, which is what this is talking about. And this is the firstling. This is the birthright offering. Every one of us are to bring the birthright offering, so we see the rights of us as being born again come to pass. And this is speaking of the tithe. We can tell some people have thought, well, how do you know that that's so? Well, we see the same thing spoken over in Deuteronomy chapter 12 in verse 6. He says, Thither you shall bring your burnt offerings, your sacrifice, your tithes, and heave offerings of the hand, and vows, and your free will offerings, and the firstlings, that's the birthright, of your herds and your flocks, the birthright offering. The tithe that was, belongs to God, it is to be brought unto him. And notice, as it says, what happened. He, God had respect for not only Abel, but also for his offering. God will have respect for you and for your offering, which will bring forth the blessings upon you in your life, if you will be a tither. He passed the test. Now, there's some that try to say that, well, this isn't for the New Testament today. Not so. It has been from the very beginning, throughout the Old Testament era, and also in the New Testament. We see that clearly shown in Hebrews 7, 8. Here, men that die receive tithes. That would be some, a minister who, of a church, in order to, for the carrying out of the work of the ministry. There, that's some other place, he receiveth them of whom it's witness that he liveth. Who is it that's witness that he liveth? Jesus is the only one who has been raised from the dead. Where is there? Where he's at? At heaven. In heaven at the right hand of the Father, he receiveth them. That means as you bring up your tithes unto him, Jesus receives them simultaneously at the same time in heaven, in the Spirit. So it is for the New Testament, and we need to make sure that we are tithers. When you do so, the blessings will come upon you. He'll rebuke the devourer for your sakes. Your fruit will come to pass in its season. You'll be a blessed delight some land. If not, you would be cursed. Another one who passed the test was Enoch. Enoch in Genesis 5, 22. Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and, and daughters. 
And it goes on and says in verse 24 that Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. He was taken up. This is all a type of the rapture of the church because he got taken up without having physical death, going through physical death. That's exactly what happens at the rapture of the church. Who are the ones that are going to be taken up? The ones who are walking with God. Young's brings out the real meaning, walking habitually. This happens to be in the his pale stem down here, which is a reflexive stem in the Hebrew, which really means he's walking for himself habitually with God. And that's what you and I are to do. Be a doer of the word and walk with him. When you walk with him, then you will be blessed, not only now, but also. The ones who are walking with the Lord consistently are the ones that are going to be with him. We see it speaks of Enoch in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. He passed the test. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. When you walk continually in the ways of the Lord, you will please him. And God is looking for every one of us to please him so that then we will be in the rapture as he speaks here of how he was translated up. The next one who passed the test was Noah. In Genesis chapter 6, we pick up in verse 8. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Why was he favored in the eyes of the Lord? These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man. He was righteous. And he was perfect. This is the word which refers to one who is upright or without blemish, as it's translated, without spot, before God in his generation. And he also walked with God, also the his pale stem, walking habitually, continually with him. Otherwise, he was consistent. He had a track record. God's looking at your track record. You need to be walking consistently with the Lord. Well, as he was just and he was upright and he was without blemish, we also see something about him. Verse 22, Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him. He obeyed the commands of the Lord. God wants us to obey the commandments of the New Testament. And then we see in chapter 7, verse 1, The Lord said to Noah, Come thou in all thy house into the ark, for thee I have seen righteous before me in this generation. He was seen as righteous because of the things that he had done. God wants every one of us to be in the same position. As Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. Notice, he had the favor of God and he was blessed because of all the things that he did. He was seen as righteous. He was seen as one walking habitually with God. He was seen with one upright, without blemish. He had the walk. That's what God is looking at. Remember, he knows us by our fruit. He knows us by our works. He knows us by the things that we are doing consistently. And it's very interesting what it says in Ezekiel chapter 14 regarding Noah. And this will be true for in the end days as well. In Ezekiel 14, 14, it says, Though these three men, Noah, Daniel and Job were in it. They had a lot of tr pressures, persecutions, things that came against them, attacks. They should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness. By your righteousness, you will be able to be delivered. Not only now, but also in the time that's going to come down the road. Notice also what it says in verse 20. Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall neither they shall deliver neither son nor daughter, but they but shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. Otherwise, you'll get delivered for your righteousness, but you aren't going to be able to take care of your family. They're going to have to be righteous themselves. You aren't going to be able to do it for them. Everybody has to work out their own salvation and walk in the ways of the Lord. And we see also as it speaks about Noah, again in the faith chapter about those who were the ones who walked by faith. Hebrews eleven seven by faith Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet. He moved with fear. He had the fear of God. 
He prepared an ark to the saving of his house by the which he condemned the world. He was going to do what God wanted. He condemned the world. Became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. We also see over in 2 Peter chapter 2 in verse 5, speaking of Noah, he spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person. And notice what else he was, a preacher of righteousness. Even though he got nobody converted, he still was a preacher of righteousness. They wouldn't listen. You should be a preacher of righteousness regardless of whether people come to the Lord. Of course, they should. The fields are now white in this era. They should come to the Lord. And bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Those that are ungodly are going to see the judgment. Those that are righteous, those that are walking with God, those that are preachers of righteousness, they're the ones that are going to be saved and be delivered. Another one who passed the test at times was Abram, whose name, of course, became Abraham. Genesis 12, 4, when God called him, Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. And Lot went with him, and Abram was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. He told him to separate himself away from that. And we see then, after he went to the place where God told him to go, and Lot had chosen one land, and he had the other, that in chapter 14, verse 12, they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, dwelt in Sodom and his goods, and departed. And then in verse 14, when Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive, here, what did he do when he found out a brother was taken captive. He armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. He divided himself against them, he and his servants by night, smote them, and pursued them into Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods, and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods, and the women also and the people. God does not want us just to be thinking about ourselves. He wants us to think about ministering to others. Those that are in captivity, to the enemy, those that are in bondage, we should be reaching out to them if they will listen. And of course, he went after them. He got armed, his trained servants, and he pursued after them, and he smote the enemies. You are to be involved in warfare intercession for others and to be ministering to others as you have opportunities. They'll be receptive to see them come out of bondage and be restored. And of course, he was recovered. Praise God. We also see that Sarah passed the test. Initially, she laughed when told that she was going to have a child, but she had to get on board. It wasn't just Abraham's faith. She had to get on board. <coughs> Hebrews 11, verse 11 shows, Hebrews 11, 11, through faith also Sarah herself, not just Abraham, but Sarah herself, received, this is the Greek word lambano, meaning to take hold of, Strength. The word strength is the word dunamis, if you see it in the lower window, which means power. Sarah took hold of power with her faith to conceive seed. She put her faith in operation and was delivered of a child when she was past age. Why? Because she judged him faithful who had promised. You have a promise? You need to know that God is faithful to perform it. And you need to consider his faithfulness in performing the word of course, she had to act on it and put her faith in operation. She took hold of power to conceive seed and see that promise come to pass. That is what God wants for you to do. Abraham also passed the test another time. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 1, It came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. The word here is one of the words that we've seen in the past. This is the word Nassau which means essentially to test by putting to the proof. He's going to put him to the proof and find out whether or not this guy's going to really walk in the ways of the Lord, obey God, and do what he wanted to do. God did put him to the test, Abraham, and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. He said, Take thou thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee in the land of Moriah. Offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Quite a statement. What did he do? He responded. He rose up early in the morning. He's going to go and obey what God told him to do. And so he's off going to this place. And we see as we come down to verse 5, notice the statement he makes. 
Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and come again to you. Otherwise, he had the confidence that him and his son were coming back because he accounted that God would be able to raise him from the dead if he did offer him because of the fact that the promise was made to him and his seed. And so this is the promised child. And so he had confidence. So we come up to, in verse 10, here he's up here, he's got him on the, uh, this altar that he made and stretched forth his hand, took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. He said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do I allow anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God. That's quite a statement. Does God know what you're going to do in every situation? No. The teaching that says God knows everything that everybody's going to do is a lying teaching. Not true. He finds out what you're going to do at a point in time. Look what he says, now I know. Otherwise, you're going to prove out that you're going to do what he says by your actions. Now that I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from me. That's the same with us. You and I need to pass the test that we'll obey God. God knows that you have the fear of God and that you will obey him by your actions, by your works, by your obedience to do the things that God tells you to do. We come down to verse 15, and because of his obedience, the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time. He said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, thou hast not withheld thine son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee. In multiplying I'll multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed, the seed is Christ, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. Obedience is the key to see blessings in your life. We must obey God and do whatever he tells us to do, and then he will bring his promises to pass for us. Joseph's another one who passed the test. He's one who walked in the ways of the Lord, obedient, did not walk in evil ways, his brothers hated him, ended up getting thrown into the pit and sold there to those that took him down to Egypt. And after he's in Egypt, we see in verse 7, it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph and she said, lie with me. She was trying to get him to commit sexual sin. He refused, said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master was not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? It came to pass, she spake to Joseph day by day. She kept pursuing him, that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. Of course, finally, when he was alone, tore his garment and then cried out saying that he was trying to do something to her, ended up getting thrown in prison. But, of course, God was with him in prison and raised him up out of there, of course, and he fulfilled everything that God told him to do because he obeyed God. Don't allow anything to lead you astray from the Word of God. Do not give place to any temptations that would come against you. Make sure that you are walking in holiness and obedience unto God. We also see the testimony about Joseph in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24. And this, I'm sorry, this is Moses, the next one we're coming to. Moses is the next one. And by, in Hebrews 11, 24, by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He passed the test as well choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Sin will be pleasurable, but only for a season because it will bring curses upon you. Yeah, he's going to do the right thing. He wasn't going to fall for this. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. Egypt's a type of the world. The world's got nothing to offer. Everything of the world is not of the Father, the Bible says. All that's in the world is going to pass away. And you want to not be a friend of the world or you be an enemy against God. Instead, 
we need to follow the way of the Lord. He had respect under the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who's invisible. He had his eyes on the big picture of what was going to come. And that's what you and I should do. We cannot walk in the ways of the world. You will not pass the test. You are to be separate and not be conformed to the ways of this world. We see another one who passed the test. When the twelve were sent out to search out the land, to see the fruit of it, and they came back and found the fruit of it. We see in Numbers 13, 27, they told him, he said, We came into the land whither thou sent us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. So this is the place. But here's then all the others brought up the evil report, saying that the people be strong in the land, and they saw the children of Anak, they saw the giants, and all these enemies are all over the land. Well, in verse 30, here we got the majority all against Caleb, but Caleb stands up and he stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it, because he was ready to obey God and do what God wanted him to do. Notice, he stood up in the face of the majority who didn't want to. You've got to stand up. There'll be times when everybody will be against you for the word of God, but you've got to choose to do what the word says regardless of what the situation is. He passed the test. He did the right thing. That is what God wants for you and for me. And what was the result, of course? We see over in chapter 14 for him. Even though they didn't get to go in and possess the land at that point in time, here's this testimony about him. Numbers 14, 24. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, and hath followed me fully. When you follow him fully, you pass the test. God wants every one of us to follow him fully. Notice what would happen. Him will I bring into the land, whereunto he went, and his seed shall possess it. You and I will be brought in to possess the promised land that God has for us and possess the promises of God in our life. And we see even though he wasn't able to get it at that time because of the judgment that came on all those for the 40 years in the wilderness that died out, we come down to Joshua chapter 14, verse 7. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought him word again as it was in my heart. That tells you something. He kept the word in his heart. You need to keep the word in your heart. Then you'll be faithful to walk in line with it. If the devil gets the word out, then you will not be walking in his ways. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. That's what God is looking for you, to wholly follow the Lord. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Sure, the land wherein thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance, thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, he said, as he said, these forty and five years. Forty-five years. Ever since, even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, now, lo, I am this day fourscore and eighty-five, in five years, which is eighty-five years old. He's eighty-five at this point. Notice what else it says about him. As yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war, but to go out and to come in. Your spiritual strength is to be maintained or increasing and should never diminish all the days of your life so that you can engage in the warfare and you can conquer all of the enemies in your life. And so he, of course, had maintained that because the word was in him. He followed the Lord fully. So he said, Now therefore give me this mountain where the Lord spake in that day, for thou heardest the day how the Anakims were there. That's all the giants. And the cities were great and fenced. If so be, the Lord will be with me. See, that's the key. If the Lord's with you because you're walking right with him, wholly following him, then I shall be able to drive them out. You can't do it in your own strength. You aren't, certainly aren't going to be able to do it if you're not walking right. But if you're walking right with the Lord and God is with you, as you are being following him, hopefully, wholly following him, you will be able to drive out all the enemies out of your life. Many people want to pursue deliverance but if you're not right with the Lord and he's not 
manifested himself with you, are you going to see victory? No, it won't happen. We've got to be holy following the Lord. So Joshua blessed them, gave Caleb the son of Jephunneh, the Hebron for the inheritance, and he got the inheritance. Why again? Because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. Keeps on saying that statement. That's what God wants us to know. You will pass the test to possess everything that God has for you, maintain your spiritual strength, and be able to possess the inheritance that belongs to you if you wholly follow the Lord. Another one who passed the test was Gideon. Gideon passed the test, as we see when he obeyed what God told him to do. Judges chapter 6, verse 11. Came an angel of the Lord, sat under the oak, which was in Ophrah, attained in the Joash the Bezerite, and son, his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. If the Lord's with us, then we know we can get the victory. That's why you've got to be right with the Lord so he can manifest himself in your life. And the guy Gideon said, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord be with us, then why has all this befallen us? Where be all his miracles? Well, it's because of all their sin. That's why they kept on walking in sin. He said, Did not the Lord bring us from Egypt? Now the Lord has forsaken us, delivers us in the hand of the Midianites. Of course, it was always because of their rebellion, their disobedience, their stubbornness, their turning back from walking in the ways of the Lord. The Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And so he sent them forth, and he went forth and did it. And when the time was for them to get ready to go forth, in Judges chapter 7, verse 3, here they had these ones come out for the battle. There were 32,000 of them that showed up. In Judges 7, 3, he said, Thou therefore go to and proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned to the people twenty and two thousand, there remained ten thousand. Twenty two thousand of the thirty two thousand were fearful and they were afraid and they're not fit for the battle. You've got to conquer fear. You're going to win the battle through faith. That's what gives you the victory. Fear, you give place to the enemy. Remember when Peter began to, when he got afraid because when the devil showed up, he began to sink. Fear will cause you to not win your battle. You must conquer all fear in your life. But that's not all. The Lord said to Gideon, the people are yet too many. Bring them down the water and I'll try them there. I'm going to try them. I'm going to test them and find out what about them here. It shall be that of whom I say unto thee, this shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And whomsoever I say unto thee, this shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. So he brought down the people in the water, and the Lord said unto Gideon, Everyone that lappeth of the water with his tongue, as a dog lappeth, him shall thou set by himself. That means he would have stuck his head down into the water to lap it up. But ev likewise, everyone that boweth down upon his knees to drink, meaning he would have taken the water and brought it up to his mouth while he was on his knees instead of all the way down in the water, which means his eyes would have been watching what was around. Those are the ones that were going to be selected. The number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were 300 men. All the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink the water. The Lord said to Gideon, By the three hundred men that lap will I save you, and deliver the Midianites with thine hand, and let all the other people go, every man to his place. Only three hundred out of the thirty-two thousand were fit, because you cannot have fear, and you must be watching. You must be spiritually attentive. You must understand the devil will try every trick. You must be wise so you don't give place to any of the attacks that he would bring against you. He passed the test. If you're in fear and you don't watch out, you don't watch and pray, you'll enter into temptation. If you're not watching, the enemy will get to you and you will not pass the test. David's another one who passed the test at times, most of the time. 1 Samuel chapter 17, we pick up over here in verse 23. Here's when the Philistine champion Goliath comes and is taunting all the armies of Israel. Verse 23, as he talked with them, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. 
Can you defeat the enemy if you have fear? No, we've already seen that. You can't. You can't be afraid. So they were going to be defeated for sure. David, though, was different. Verse 26. David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? Notice that he said about taking away the reproach. The reproach would be if they got be defeated by their enemies. If you're getting defeated by your, the enemies, then there's a reproach upon us because we should get the victory. God has given us authority over all the power of the enemy, and he wants every one of us to be completely victorious. We see it continually. He that overcomes and conquers and carries off the victory, that's the one that's going to enter into all the things that God has for us. So, notice what else he says. Uncircumcised Philistine. What does that mean? That meant this guy was, in covenant relation, was not in covenant relationship with God because they were circumcised. is how they came into the covenant. That he should defy the armies of the living God. That means he is covenant-minded and he knows this guy doesn't have a covenant. David understood about covenant relationship. You must understand about covenant relationship as well. Verse 32, David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. He had no fear. He had absolute confidence what God would do because he already understood what God would do and had seen it happen in the past. Verse 34, David said to Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep. There came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine, again, pointing out he didn't have a covenant, shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. That is what God wants us to understand. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion, the, out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. That's confidence, knowing what God will do. You can't hope, God, well, God will maybe do this. You've got to know what God will do. He says, He will. Deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. you got to be knowing what God will do, and we know it because of his word, the promises he's given us. And as we operate in faith, we know God's faithful to perform his word and bring it to pass. Well, so he's going to go. Of course, Saul tried to arm David with his armor, armor of the, armor of the flesh. Well, that's not going to do it. Verse 39, David girded his sword upon his armor and said to go, for he had not proved it. So he said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. That shows you another thing. The things that God has given unto us, they've got to be proved in your life. Otherwise, have you proved that the Word of God will work because you've worked it? You've used the weapons of warfare. You've conquered enemies in your life. You need to have a track record of having proved the things of God. Well, of course, David had proved the others and not this. And so he put them off from him. And then, of course, he's going to go after him now. In verse 45, David said to the, said, said, then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, with a spear, with a shield. Physical weapons. I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the army of Israel, whom thou hast defied. I'm coming with a spiritual weapon, and I'm coming with the Lord operating through me, because I'm coming in the name of the Lord, which brings him personally present on the scene. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand. Confidence. Not hope maybe to work out. He knew you got to know what God will do as you do the word. And I will smite thee and take thine head from thee. I'll give the carcasses of the hosts of the Philistines this day and the fowls of the earth, the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Actually, when you're fighting your battle, you are really proving to everybody that God is the true and living God who will crush your enemies underfoot. He wants you to rise up and operate as a king and use the authority that he's given you to defeat all the enemies. Well, that's what he did. The assembly will know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle's the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. You have to know the battle's the Lord's. But how do we put the battle of the Lord into operation? When you do what his word says. You put him into operation when you fight. You fight with the fight, your faith. That puts him in operation in the realm of the spirit, and the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you the victory. So it came to pass when the Philistine arose, came and drew nigh to meet David. What did David do? He had no fear whatsoever. He knew that God was going to take this guy out. 
He knew that the battle was the Lord's. He already had proved it. He knew that God would give him the victory. So what's he do? He hasted and ran toward him. He's going to run after this guy and get rid of him. He didn't hesitate for a moment. If you're hesitating, do you have confidence? Do you really believe? Do you know what God will do for you? We should not be hesitating. We should know what God will do. He ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. That shows confidence. Put his hand in the bag, took thence the stone, slang it, smote the Philistine in his forehead. The stone stunk, sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth, and he was defeated. What do we see about him? He didn't have any fear. He was covenant-minded. He was bold and confident in God and knew exactly what God would do. He had experience in proving God's victory in his life. He got the true things that he proved, got what God had for him, the weapons that God had. And he ran at the enemy, and he smote him and took him out. You must have the same principles here and things established in you if you are going to pass the test. We see further that David passed the test when they had an attack from the enemies. Verse Samuel 30, verse 1. It came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziglag on the third day that the Malachites had invaded the south Ziglag and smitten Ziglag and burned it with fire. They took all these captives. Verse 3, David and men came to the city. Behold, it was burned with fire. Their wives, sons, and daughters were taken captives. The enemy had attacked. Has the enemy attacked and done any damage in any manner against you in your life? If so, are you supposed to put up with it? No. Of course, they were all upset about it because of what had happened. And we come to verse 6. David was greatly distressed, not because of what all those things. Why does it say? For the people spake of stoning him. They wanted to blame him for the problem. Because of the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. Why would they blame him? Who's the problem? The enemy. So don't get an attitude against God or against somebody, you know. You're the, who's the problem? The devil's the problem. What did David do? He did the right thing. He encouraged himself in the Lord. Encouraging is the opposite of discouraging. Discourage is a loss of courage. Encourage is taking courage in. You need to take courage in in whatever situation you might be dealing with. And so, he comes in verse 8, inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? He answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. That's what God tells us to do. You pursue after all the enemies that have come in and stolen from you, or have caused some damage. You're going to pursue them. You're going to overtake them. You're going to, without fail, recover all. And so they went. Verse 17, when he caught up with them, he smote them from the twilight even to the evening of the next day. There escaped not a man of them, save 400 young men which rode upon camels and fled. He recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away, and he rescued his two wives. There was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil nor anything that they'd taken to them. David recovered all. David was a king, you are a king. You are able to recover all as well. God is a God who brings total restoration. He's a healer. He's a deliverer. He will bring forth victory for you in your life. And we see David's psalm of thanksgiving for what he accomplished in 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 38. Here he's speaking of what he did. He says in verse 38, I have pursued my enemies. He got on the offensive. If you're going to pass the test, you've got to get on the offensive against the devils and destroyed them. We're going to get on the offensive by casting out the demons and attacking them or speaking to them to be removed if there is like a mountain or casting them down if we're dealing with things from the heavenlies. You get on the attack against them. Destroyed them and turn not again till I consume them. That means he just didn't have one quick little fight and that was it. No, he continued on. He did not turn again until he'd consumed the enemies, showing it was an ongoing battle. I've consumed them and wounded them. They could not arise, yet they're fallen under my feet. For thou, God's the one who girded me with strength to battle. Them that rose up against me hast thou subdued under me. Anything that ri any devil that rises against you, you can subdue it underfoot. God gives you the strength for the battle. 
Thou hast also given me the necks of mine enemies, that I might destroy them that hate me. You are going to pursue and conquer all your enemies. If you do, you'll pass the test. If you don't, you won't pass the test. We cannot allow the enemies to stay in us. Remember, when they went to possess the land, it wasn't just possessing the land only. It was driving out all of the ites. They have to be driven out in order to possess the land. And that's what God wants. We see another one who passed the test. And this is one of the mighty men of David. 2 Samuel 23, verse 9. After him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo the Aohite, one of the three mighty men with David. When they defied the Philistines that were there gathered together to battle, the men of Israel were gone away. So here he is. He's all by himself, alone, and there's nobody to help him. And yet the enemies, the Philistines, were arrayed against him. He arose. He smote the Philistines until his hand was weary. So he's smiting and smiting and smiting and smiting and smiting. You're going to be doing the very same thing. You war with your mouth, speaking either the word or speaking in line with the word. And notice, his hand, until his hand was weary. That meant there was a lot of fighting. His hand clave under the sword. Well, how does your hand cleave into the sword for us? The sword in the New Testament is the sword of the Spirit, which is the spoken word of God, rhema, spoken word. So when the word is being spoken or your mouth is in operation, your sword is in hand. If you lay your, quit speaking, you laid your sword down, so to speak, because you're not wielding it against the enemy. His hand clave to the sword, which means you keep your mouth speaking. You keep warring with your mouth against the enemies as long as it takes, as consistently as it takes, until you see the victory. Notice, the Lord wrought a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to spoil. God wants us to get into the warfare mode and get on the offensive. You're going to pass the test if you get on the offensive and you stay on the offensive to drive out all of the enemies out of your life until they're all put underfoot. We see another case where one passed the test, and this is talking about Elijah. The people had turned away from the Lord. They were following after Baal, and there were only a few that were following after the way of the Lord. And in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 20, Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. These are all the false prophets. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt you between two opinions? See, they were turning away from the true and living God and following after Baal, a false, false god. If the Lord be God, follow him. And if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, Not a word. Then said Elijah unto the people, I only, I only remain a prophet of the Lord. Of course, it wasn't so, but he thought that at that time. Baal's prophets were 450 men. Let them cut it, the, the, them, therefore, and give us two bullocks. He started telling them about getting the bullocks, cut them in pieces, lay it on the wood, lay it on like an altar that they built. And he comes down here, and he says in verse 24, Call you on the name of your gods, and I'll call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answers by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, It is well spoken. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose you out your bullock, dress it, do whatever you want to do, call on the name of your gods, put no fire under. So we have a name contest. We're going to find out who is the true and the living God. And so they did this. Verse 26, they took the bullock that was given them, they dressed it, called on the name of Baal from morning to even until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. And there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar that was made. It came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he's talking, or he's pursuing, he's a journey. Preventure he sleepeth. He must be awakened, you know, mocking him, them. They cried aloud, cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancelets, and all till the blood gushed out upon, upon them came to pass when midday was past, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. There was neither voice nor any to answer nor any that regarded. So, and he can't be the true and living one. They tried to work after him all day long. Nothing happened. So Elijah comes, says, come near unto me, to, to talk to the people. People came near to him. He said, he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Took the 12 stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, 
upon whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel should be thy name. And with the stones he builds an altar in the name of the Lord. He makes a trench around the altar. And what's he do? He puts the wood in order, and he says down here, fill four barrels of water. Pours the water on the burnt sacrifice, on the wood. So this can't this can be a fluke, you know. Fire isn't going to burn something up when there's water. Do it the second time. Did it the second time. Do it the third time. They did it the third time. The water ran about the altar and filled the trench also with water. It came to pass the time of the offering, the evening sacrifice, that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, that I am thy servant, that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt soft sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the dust, licked up the water that was in the trench. And so he had shown the fact of who was the true and living God. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces. They said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. That applies to us because... If you ever come in contact with someone that tries to say that your God isn't a true God, you're going to have a proof test. Who is the true and living God? You can call on the name of the Lord and God will respond. You can cast out the demons and you'll, they'll see the demons. They won't get any demons coming out of them. You can pray and release the power of God and God will manifest himself. Otherwise, you've got to know who God is and you've got to know what the name of the Lord will do and you speak in the name of the Lord, it'll prove who the true and living God is. There may be times when you're going to have to do that. But that's, one, that's how he proved it. He put, put him to the test and showed the power of God to be manifest. God wants us to be able to manifest the power of God and his authority and see him manifest that he will bring forth Evidence the fact that he is the true and the living God and do the mighty works of the Lord. That's why you need to be able to cast out demons. You cast out the demons, people start being set free from bondages. They can't, nobody else can do that. Only those that are born again and that understand they have the name of Jesus and have faith in the name of Jesus. We see another one who passed the test. This is Elisha. In chapter 6, of 2 Kings. Elisha was a prophet, and what was happening was, if we pick up in verse 8, the king of Syria was warring against Israel, the enemy. He took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. The man of God said unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. The prophet knew where he was. He picked up in the spirit what was going on, told him, Don't go to this place, because this is where they are. King of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him and saved himself there not once nor twice. He kept on being delivered from the attacks because he knew where, what the plans of the enemy was and where he was. The heart of the king of Israel was sore troubled for this thing. He called his servants and said unto them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? One of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet that's in Israel telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. That's the word of knowledge. That's why God wants you to seek after the gifts of the Spirit. Get filled up with the Holy Spirit. God wants to use you, and He will speak. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are for today, and the word of knowledge is what He was getting about what was going on, is something that God will manifest. Of course, he, so He knew exactly where He was in every case. Go and spy where He is. I may send and fetch Him. He said, Behold, He's in Dothan. Otherwise, they're going to go after the, the prophet. Well, if he already knew all your other plans, do you think he's going to know these plans as well? Sure he is. Therefore sent he hither four horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night and compassed the city about. When the servant, the man of God, was risen early, gone forth, behold, the host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. Didn't he know they were coming? Of course he knew they were coming. Is he going to run away from them? No. His servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? He answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. You got to know, there's more angels ready to fight warring angels with you than all the devils out there. And they're stronger than the enemies. You can get the victory. 
Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire. Those are all the angels round about Elisha, ready to perform what he would speak. And they came down, remember the angels, hearken to the voice of the word. When they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. Blindness that finished them off. God wants you to rise up and use the authority to conquer the enemies. However, whatever needs to be done, Paul did the very same thing where he smote that guy with a temporary blindness and when he was trying to turn the deputy away from the faith. These are miraculous works. God wants you to believe in God, a God of miracles, a God of power, a God of might, a God who will deliver you, heal you, and even perform miraculous works with even smoting smite and with blindness. God is a God of power. He hadn't changed a bit. He smote them, and that was the end of them. He passed the test. We see another one who passed the test over in 2 Chronicles. In each one of these cases, they believed God. They had faith in Him. They trusted in Him. They knew their covenant. They knew what God would do. You've got to know what God will do. You will pass the test in every situation if you know what God will do. If you don't know what he's going to do, you aren't going to pass the test because you're not in faith. How am I going to know what God will do? Because of his word. What he says, he will do it. He will perform it. And you have to have proved him in your life. You know, if you're going to see God bring forth the things that he purposes. In 2 Chronicles chapter 14, Asa began to reign. Here it's Asa's son reigned in his stead. At first, Asa did a good job. Verse 2, Asa did that was good and right in the eyes of the Lord. God wants us to do what is good and right in the eyes of the Lord. Took away the altars of the strange gods, the high places, break down the images, cut down the groves. He got rid of everything that was ungodly. Commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers to do the law and the commandment. You and I should be seeking the Lord and being a hearer and a doer of the word of God and the laws of Christ and the commandments of the New Testament. He took away out of all the cities of Judah the high places and images, and the kingdom was quiet before him. He destroyed all the works of the enemy. That is what God wants you to do to pass the test. He built fenced cities in Judah, for the land had rest. He had no war in those years because the Lord had given him rest. No war. That's because he was doing right. He had conquered all the enemies. And when you conquer all the enemies and you do right, God will give you spiritual rest as we possess the promises and conquer the enemies in our life. He said to Judah, let us build these cities, make about them walls, towers, gates, bars, while the land's yet before us. Because we've sought the Lord our God, we've sought him, and he's given us rest on every side. So they built and prospered. When you have conquered all your enemies, and you have seen them smit, been smitten underfoot, and you have come to the place of spiritual rest, possessing the promises, you will be able to build and prosper in the way that God wants you to, instead of having to always be fighting all these battles all the time. Asa had an army of men that bear targets and spears, and of Judah, 300,000, about of Benjamin, they bear shields and drew bows, and, and four score, that's 280,000. All these were mighty men of valor. They all got trained up to become mighty. That's what God wants for you and me. You see, he's going to raise up the mighty, end-time, glorious church. It's going to be full of power and full of might, full of the Holy Ghost, full of wisdom. They're going to be mighty. You are to be one of those. Every one of us are to be mighty men and women of valor, that we will be mighty before the Lord and do all the things that he wants us to do. There came out against them, Zerah, the Ethiopian, with a host of a thousand thousand. That's a million, a million Ethiopians attacking them and 300 chariots, and he came into Marishah. Asa went out against them. They set the battle in array in the valley. Notice he went out against them. He wasn't afraid of them. You've got to have confidence. You go after your enemies. And anything that tries to come against you, you get on the offensive after them. Cried in the Lord as God said, Lord, is nothing with thee to help, whether with many or with them that have no power. Help us, O Lord, our God, for we rest on thee in thy name. We go against this multitude, O Lord, for thou art God. Let not man prevail against thee. He went in the name. You and I are going to go in the name of Jesus. Everything you do in the name of Jesus, the name that brings him manifesting his power, uh, his authority as you speak forth. And notice, 
He totally trusted in the Lord as they went forth. You got to know the battle's the Lord's. The victory is yours, but you've got to go against the enemies. So the Lord smote the Philistines before Asa and poor Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. Asa and the people that were with them pursued them, and the Gerer and the Ethiopians were overthrown. They could not recover themselves, so they were destroyed before the Lord, before his host, and they carried away very much spoil. They got the victory. They went after him. They did what was right in the sight of the Lord. Verse 15, he says, they smote also, I'm sorry, in chapter 15, I want to go to, chapter 15, I'm sorry. Chapter 15, the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded, and he goes out to meet Asa, this is after they won the battle, and he said, hear me, Asa, the Lord is with you while you be with him. If you seek him, he'll be found of you. If you and I will seek him, he'll reveal himself to us. Seek and you shall find. But we've got to seek him diligently. If you forsake him, he will forsake you. That's true. People that think that if you forsake him, he won't forsake you, that's a lie. He will forsake you. However you treat him is how he's going to treat you. You seek him, he's going to reveal himself unto you. Well, you come down to verse 8. When Asa heard the words of this prophecy, he took courage, put away the abominable idols out of all the land of Judah and Benjamin, out of the cities that taken from Mount Ephraim, and renewed the altar of the Lord that was before the porch of the Lord gathered all Benja uh, Judah and Benjamin, the strangers with them, out of Ephraim and Manasseh and out of Simeon, they for they fell to him out of Israel in abundance when they saw the Lord as God was with them. All these ones were coming, and they were seeing God do great things. We come down to verse 12, and look at the statement. They entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart, with all their soul. God wants you to seek him with all your heart and all your soul. Not just if you have time, if it fits into your schedule. <laughs> That's ridiculous. You've got to put God first place in your life. You're going to seek him with all your heart, with all your soul. Whosoever would not seek the Lord God of Israel should be put to death. Quite a statement. Whether small or great, whether man or woman. And then we come to verse 15. All Judah rejoiced at the oath, for they were sworn with all their heart and sought him with their whole desire. He was found to them, and the Lord gave them rest round about. Who does the Lord give rest to? The ones that seek him with their whole desire, with all their heart, all their soul, their whole being. That is what God wants for you and me. We're going to truly put him first place. And look what else he did. Also concerning Micaiah, the mother of Asa, the king, he removed her from being queen. Huh. Hey, it didn't matter whether there was a you know, family member or not. Why? Because she made an idol in a grove. Someone that's not going to walk right in the ways of the Lord, in this case, make an idol in a grove, they have to be dealt with. It doesn't mean matter if it's a family member. And Asa cut her da down her idol and stamped it and burned it. And she was removed. We've got to stand up. Remember, you can't compromise. You love father, mother, son, daughter, anybody more than him, you're not worthy of him, the scripture says. We must do what's right. The high places were not taken away out of Israel. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was perfect all his days. And then in verse 19, there was no more war until the five and thirtieth year of the reign of Asa. This is when Asa did good. After that, he made a big mistake because the fact that he didn't look to the Lord to help him. Instead, he looked for a king to help him against the enemy. And that was a mistake. And of course, he was rebuked by the prophet. He got mad at him, put him in jail. Of course, because of that, a disease came upon him for two years and he ended up dying. But he did pass the test until he made some mistakes. That also tells you, when you pass the test, you'll see God manifest himself mightily. And in this case, no more war. He'll bring you to the place of victory. But you get away from him and don't do what he says, you're going to be in trouble. We must follow, remember the prophecy, you seek him, you'll be found of him. But if you forsake him, he'll forsake you. And that's exactly what happened to him at the very end. We also see another one who passed the test. Second Chronicles, chapter 17, Jehoshaphat. Jehosh 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 Jehoshaphat, verse 1, his son reigned in the stead and strengthened himself against Israel. He placed forces in all the defense cities. Otherwise, he did all the things that God wanted him to do. And the Lord was with Jehoshaphat. Why? 
because he walked in the first ways of his father David and sought not to Balaam. Again, these guys all had the walk that shows the consistency of hearing and doing the word. That's what must be done. He sought the Lord God of his father, walked in his commandments, not after the doings of Israel. Therefore, the Lord established the kingdom in his hand. All Judah brought to Jehoshaphat presence. He had riches and honor and abundance. He was blessed. He was ruling and reigning. Great things were happening for him. His heart was lifted up in the ways of the Lord. That's what it should be. Moreover, he took away the high places and the groves out of Judah, which means he was conquering all of the works of the enemy. That's what you see. You're a king. You're to conquer all the enemy's works. You're to walk in all the ways of the Lord. Your heart's to be totally lifted up in the ways of the Lord and do what is right in his sight. And we even see further what he did. In verse 8, he sent the Levites, and it lists all these Levites, and what did they do? They taught in Judah and had the book of the law of the Lord with them. They taught the word of God to them. That's the other thing. The word of God is to be being taught. You need to get it in you, and you need to teach it to others. The word of God was being put first place with them all. And these people got the knowledge of God. Remember, my people destroyed for lack of knowledge. We've got to get the word of God in us so we know his word. We know how the enemy works. We know how, what we need to do, that what's the responsibilities that we have, and what we must do to see victory. And the fear of the Lord fell upon all the kingdoms of the land. The fear of the Lord fell upon them because they were walking in the way of the Lord. The fear of the Lord will fall upon all your enemies if you're walking in the way of the Lord. If you're walking in sin, eh, the door's open. They're going to come at you. And they will be able, they won't have any fear of you whatsoever. If you're walking in sin, they'll be able to bring destruction against you. Because of this, they made no war against Jehoshaphat. He was doing the right thing and obeyed and carried out what God wanted. We see another one who passed the test was Hezekiah. Second Chronicles 31. And we pick up over here in verse 20. Hezekiah did, thus did Hezekiah through all Judah, and wrought that which was good and right and truth before the Lord is God. That's what God wants of you. He wants you to do what's good, what's right, and what is always in line with the truth. In every work that he began in the service of the house of the Lord, the law and the commandments to seek as God, he did it with all his heart and prospered. And again shows you who passed the test. When you do something with all your heart, you can't do things half-hearted. You must put God first place, evidenced by you do things with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, everything about you. Then there was the time when an attack was going to come. We see in chapter 32, Sennacherib, who was the king of Assyria, came, and he was coming to attack them and to bring destruction against them. In fact, he's a type of the Antichrist because we see in verse 9, when Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, sent his servants to him, and he was on the attack against them, he was saying, Wherein do you trust that you abide in the siege in Jerusalem? Did not Hezekiah persuade you to give over yourselves to die by famine and by thirst, saying, The Lord our God shall deliver us out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Hath not the same Hezekiah taken away his high places and his altars and commanded Judah and Jerusalem, saying, You shall worship before one altar and burn incense upon it? Know ye not what I and my fathers have done to all the people of the land? And were the gods of the nations of these lands anyways able to deliver their land out of my hand? Otherwise, nobody can deliver them out of my hand. He thought he, nobody could defeat him whatsoever. Who was there among all the gods of those nations that my fathers utterly destroyed, that they could deliver his people out of my hand, that your God should be able to deliver you out of my hand? He's speaking against the true and living God. Anything that ever comes against you to say that God won't do such and such, that's the devil coming. You better rise up and come against them and be ready to, to smite all those enemies and defeat them. Of course, he was telling them, don't let Hezekiah deceive you or persuade you in this manner, thinking that you're going to be able to get victory over them. Much oh, that God would deliver you out of my hand. <laughs> that's the enemy taunting them continually. And the servants spake more against the Lord God and against his servant Hezekiah. He kept, Hezekiah kept speaking against them. The Antichrist will do the same thing. He's going to speak against the, the Most High God, going to speak against him continually. Well, that, of course, he wrote all, all types of different things, wrote also letters to rail on the Lord God of Israel and speak against him. Probably going to see all that happen from the Antichrist when he comes on the scene. 
As the gods of the nations of other lands have not delivered their people out of my hand, so shall not the God of Hezekiah deliver his people out of my hand. Just really coming against him. That's exactly what's going to happen down the line as we come. They spake against the God of Israel. The Jerusalem is against the gods of the people of the earth, which were the work of the hands of men. For this cause, Hezekiah the king and the prophet uh, of Isaiah, the son of Amos, prayed and cried to heaven. Well, they, he, this guy was coming against them. So the Lord sent an angel. You think that God's not going to stand up and do something about it? He will. The Lord sent an angel which cut off all the mighty men of valor and the leaders and captains in the camp of the, of the king of Assyria. So they returned with shame of face to his own land. It was coming to the house of his God that they came forth out of his own bowels and slew him there with a sword. They even slew the king out of his own house. Judgment came upon him. Anybody that speaks against the true and living God is going to have judgment coming against them. Well, we see the fact that another statement that's interesting that you, you need to see in chapter 32. Later on, of course, we see if we pick up down here in verse 23, he was magnified in all the sight of the nations. And then in verse 24, in those days Hezekiah was sick to the death and prayed unto the Lord. He was sick. What happened to him when he was sick? We see the account over in Isaiah, chapter 38. He just didn't give, it, give in, even when the prophet came and told him. See, Hezekiah was a guy who followed the Lord. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came and said to him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed unto the Lord. Remember now, O Lord, I beseech you, how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. He had a track record. He had some reasons to bring this forth. And he wept sore. Then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah, saying, Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will add unto thy days fifteen years, and I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend the city. And he did, because of the fact that he had a walk before the Lord. God wants you to have a walk before the Lord as well. Walking before him in truth, perfect heart, doing what is right in the sight of the Lord. He passed the test of the Lord and did the things that God wanted him to do. Well, we see over here in uh, chapter, th in, uh, back in uh, Second Chronicles. In Second Chronicles, this interesting statement, though, after this, chapter 32, he made some mistakes after this. After he got healed, here's when he got sick, and then he got healed after that. It picks up here. Hezekiah rendered not again according to the benefit done unto him, for his heart was lifted up. He got pride because of this. Well, that was a mistake. He did good up to that point. Then there was wrath upon him. You get in pride, you're going to have judgments that comes, and upon Judah and upon Jerusalem and the wrath was becoming upon them. Well, he did the right thing, though, right away. Notwithstanding, Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart, both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And because he humbled himself, so the wrath of the Lord came not upon him in the days of Hezekiah, but it was going to come later. He had repented, so it wouldn't come upon him. But it's also interesting, we come down to verse 31, and a statement that it makes. Howbeit in the business of the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon who sent unto him to inquire of the wonder that was done in the land, because they, they heard about him being healed, and they wanted to find out what happened. God left him to try him, that he might know all that was in his heart. That's quite a statement. Otherwise, God's not going to necessarily tell you everything, every time. In this case, he just left him alone to try him. I just wanted to see what he was going to do on his own. Was he going to walk in the ways of the Lord or not? that he might know what's all in his heart. God is going to give you the word, but there'll be times when he'll just kind of leave you alone and see, are you going to walk this walk from these things that I've taught you in the past? Are you going to walk this walk? And he may not even respond to your prayer necessarily, 
to try him, to know what was in all his heart. If we do what he says, we'll pass the test. If we don't do what he says, that's what happens so often. Remember with the judges? The judges would come and they'd get them straight and they'd start walking the way of the Lord and they were blessed. And then the judge would die. God, there wasn't anybody there to tell them what to do. They should have known what to do, but they didn't. And they started walking the ways of sin until another prophet or another judge comes and calls them on the carpet and calls them to repentance. We should learn to walk in the ways of the Lord, not have to have someone come and always tell us what to do and correct us all the time. We should get involved, walk in the ways of the Lord so that we have a track record and this is our lifestyle. We should be following him all the days of our life. Praise God. One last one before we stop for this morning. Ezra is one who passed the test. In Ezra chapter 7, in verse 6, Ezra, he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses. The Lord God of Israel had given him. The king granted him all his requests according to the hand of the Lord. And God's hand was upon him. When you put the word of God first place, God will, his pan will be upon you in your life. Verse 10, Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, to do it, and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. That's what God wants for us. He wants us to prepare our heart that we're going to seek after the law of the Lord, we're going to be a doer of the word, and we're going to get it in us to teach others. He wants you to know the word so you can teach it to others. That's how well you should know the word of God. It should be established in your heart. And as you do so, then you're going to be a vessel for God to use you to minister to others. As you do the word, then God's blessings will be upon you. And he'll protect you, he'll deliver you, he'll bring forth the promises in your life, He'll raise you up to become strong and mighty, and He will speak to you and show you what to do. You can come to the place of having no wars, rest, spiritual rest, having conquered the enemies in your life, possessed the promises, walking His ways, perfect heart. Look at all the things that these guys had. They walked habitually, continually in the ways of the Lord. They had a perfect heart. They were seeking Him with their whole heart and the whole desire. They followed Him wholly, fully, did everything that he wanted him to do. We see all these things that are brought forth. We must do what he says. They got on the offensive against their enemies. They proved the things of God. They relied on the covenant. These are all the things that show how you're going to pass the spiritual tests and walk with the Lord. If you do so, you will walk in victory and you will see God bring forth his promises in your life. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the word of God that brings revelation of those who passed the test and how they did it. I thank you. I will pass the test by being a doer of the Word of God. I will walk in line with your Word. I will be obedient. I will operate in faith. I will trust in you. I will not give place to any temptations to sin. I will not be moved by what the majority of people do. I will do what is right. I will not compromise for any person. I will wholly follow the Lord. I will have no fear. I will watch and I will pray. I will be covenant minded. I will know what you will do. You will absolutely defeat all of my enemies. I will prove your works in my life as I do the word. And I will pursue and run after the enemy and smite him continually, getting on the offensive. I will encourage myself in the Lord. And as I smite all the enemies, I will overtake them. I will recover all. I will keep my mouth in operation as I swing the sword continually until the enemies are put underfoot. And I thank you that as I smite every enemy, I walk with a perfect heart. I'm obedient in all things. I seek you with all of my heart, all of my soul, my whole desire. I do what's right in your sight. I have a perfect heart and I won't compromise for anybody, even a family member. I will do what's right in your sight. As I walk in the fear of the Lord, being obedient, carrying out the will of God, I thank you. You will bring your blessings. 
I will pass the test. I will be approved of you. And I will see your hand upon me. I will see your victory come forth in my life. And I will enter into the spiritual rest. And I will come to the place of no more wars. The enemies will be put underfoot. And I will be prospering and being blessed in all that I do. I thank you. I'm going to do what you say. I will walk in your ways, obedient in all things, and I will pass the test. Thank you, Lord. As I pass the test, I know that all these things that you have promised will come to pass in my life because I am a continual hear and doer of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. These guys passed the test. We talked about all the ones that failed. We've talked about these up to now. We've got more to talk about tonight. We're going to pick up from here and just move on through the rest of the Old Testament and into the New Testament and see all the things that those, did, those ones did. Because they, these guys are all recorded in the Word to show us what we should do. They're all examples to show us the things that you and I need to do to see the same victories come forth in our life. Father, we thank you for all that you brought forth. We will pass the tests. We will be doers of the word. We know that you are the same yesterday, today, forever. You don't change. You perform your word. What you've done for one, you'll do for all. And you will bring all these promises to pass and give us victory as we pass the test by hearing and doing your word. Thank you, Father, for all that you accomplish as we are doers of this word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Tonight we continue.